the kind introduction and for the invitation. Uh, this is my home, so I'm from Barcelona, even though I'm, I don't even know where I am right now. Uh, part of my group is in Stuttgart. Um, part of my group is here at IBEC Institute of Bio uh, Bioengineering. So the title of my talk is Nano Microbots, What For? Uh, you, well, first of all, let me, let me thanks before I run out of time, which is the very common thing, right, my team. So that, that picture was like a couple of months ago, and this picture needs to be updated. So we are growing more in Barcelona. We are decreasing at the Max Planck, uh, but it's always thanks, thanks to them. So I'm not the guy doing the experiments that I'm showing to you right now. Uh, about micro, micro nanobots, I'm sure if you just go to Google, because that's what I did half an hour ago, you might find a lot of pictures from what, what for, right? You will see uh, very visionary robots that can go in through, uh, through your beings and then can cure cancer that's far from reality. And, and one of the, the farthest things is the structure, as you will see in this talk. The structure of the visionary robot is not actually what you will see during my talk. Okay, there's other more crazy, uh, much crazy st uh, structure here that uh, this is not, not going to happen, at least until I'm, I'm here uh, before I get retired. But if you go back in time, you will see, uh, you can find this uh, fantastic Voyage movie where they, they make a small submarine and they put a troop of uh, crew that can go through, through the body of a patient and can cure some, some diseases. This maybe people say nano nano machines are inspired by nature, uh, by by science fiction. People say science fiction was inspired by Richard Feynman talk, uh, where he envisioned something that can be nanotechnology can go through through your body. But the true reality is that we need to learn from nature. Actually, if you look at, at the talks that you will see today and during these days, uh, it's not that difficult to envision that we can make nano devices. We can, of course, not miniaturize human beings, but we can make micro nanostructures. Have you seen nano wires today, right? But how to make them moving? That's a different point, right? So for that, we need to look back into nature because we've seen many micro and nano swimmers inside our body, or even like this here, you see bacteria that move through uh, a flux of protons. So this is chemistry converted into motion, okay? So that's actually what you are going to see today, things moving in solution. Uh, if you look again into nature, you'll see many examples, right? Like cells take energy, chemical energy, to divide and to migrate, to do chemotaxis, to go from one point to another point. You can see bacteria, you can say, see virus, or even enzymes have been named to be uh, motors or nanorobots in, in biological environments because they convert and they rotate. So thi things that you're going to see today, not only things moving, but these motors that are very powerful and can move cargo from one point to another. Okay, so then what we try to do is to make artificially or man-made design micro nanobots. And one of the questions here is how to make them moving, right? As, as I told you, we will use chemistry, but there's a big challenge to move at the macro nanoscale. And that was named, that was explained many years ago, about 30 years by this very seminal and, and very, uh, yeah, a scholarly uh, paper from Porcel, 1977, where it says that um, define the low Reynolds number. So this is us moving, we are moving, it doesn't matter the equation, we're not going in detail, but here's the conversion between inertia and viscosity. And upon scaling down in the, the micro nano scale, you will have very small Reynolds numbers. So what does it mean? It means that the viscosity is very high for them, or on the other, or in other words, it's like there's inertia is hopeless. There is no inertia at all, right? And then it's, this is like if you are moving in a pool full of honey. So as soon as you stop moving, right, they stop swimming, you won't go anywhere. So what does it mean again? So things that go smaller and smaller, they feel the viscosity much higher. Therefore, they need much power and they need a continuous propulsion. It cannot be step by step. Okay, so this needs to be continuously produced. So that's very challenging. So how do we get this motion? Uh, there is a, a review from Joe Wan where he summarized a couple of years ago different mechanisms. So I will focus on catalytic because I'm chemist by education and most of the things, or almost all the things we're doing are based on chemistry, but you can use also people from Max Plan like an ETH Zurich that are using magnetic uh, guidance, magnetic uh, stimulation to guide nanorobotics, very, very amazing uh, things. Electric, light, and ultrasound. So there are a lot of words moving now on ultrasound power nano devices. But as I said, I will focus on this catalytic, and this started like many of the things that we do in our lab by George Whitesides. 
So he's an amazing chemistry, as you may know. Uh, he took a PDMS plate here and then spattered platinum on one side. They put this platinum plate, uh, PDMS platinum plate, in a peroxide solution. So that's the structure you are, or the chemical reaction. Very simple. Hydrogen peroxide to give oxygen and water. Okay, so this platinum will decompose peroxide to give oxygen bubbles. This plate will turn around. But that's not nanomotors, that's not micromotors. But thanks to nanotechnology, as we've seen today about nanowires, you can make nanowires that started by Sen and Maluk in 2004, be metallic nanowires, they can put in peroxide and they will move in solution. I'm just giving you a quick overview of what people have done. You can have Janus particles, so it's two phases where the chemical reaction happens only on the platinum side, and this is pushing the particle forward. And that's the work started in Dresden from Oliver Smith and other people uh, making tubes that you will see today, and then uh, supramolecular chemistry, and then nanoparticles. So you see there are many different structures, but none of them are like the ones you can find in Google. Right? So we don't have any complex parts. Life is very simple. You've seen cells are just flat or rounded. Uh, bacteria are like rods, right? Life is simple. Why to envision super complicated devices, okay? So that's the message I want to, to explain here. Uh, some reading, we just published recently three reviews. One in Angevante, designing the chemically powered nanomotors, then things that you will see in the second part of my talk about enzyme catalysis, which I think is going to be the future of, of how to make them moving, more biocompatible, more, more efficient, uh, uh, propulsion and also the type, the talk that today will be how to design micro nano swimmers for specific uh, application, and that's hopefully this is going to be the cover in accounts in the next week. So this is just since last week, and this is like current current issue. This is the cover you can find in ACS Nano. So these are the two applications you will see today because that's what for environmental application and bio application. So let's go to my talk. But before there, you might have heard that there was a Nobel Prize this year about uh, nanomachines. So we are very glad in our community. They are doing uh, the same thing. So if you go to all the summary of the, these discoveries, it's going to be the same. Nanomachines that convert chemistry into motion. Okay? So then, then Sauvage, I don't know actually him personally, but we are very glad that in a conference I organized every two years, Fritz Stoddard was giving the opening talk this July. And Feringar uh, invited me a couple of weeks to go to, actually two weeks before the Nobel Prize to go there. And you will see some of the things from Feringa here in the talk. But this, this hopefully, and it's very, very lucky that people recognize, also scientists recognize the impact of these, these things. So what is a nanorobot? Here's my definition. Again, you won't find this in UPAC, sorry, just to help me guide into my talk. It's something that can be self-powered. So it, it's in situ generates the energy. Then while we are moving, then we want them to be smart. It means that it needs to be reactive to some stimuli. You need to be able to tell them go from the point A to point B. So once, once I'm here, I need to do some complex task. I need to do something, right? So I will do something like transport of cargo or the drilling, as you will see later. Versatile, we want to have different shapes. And if you want to do different applications, you need to be biocompatible and, and multifunctional. So these are the three structures that we have in our lab. The first one is a tube. I'm not going to go into the details how we make them, but just imagine you have a poster at the nanoscale. You stretch it, as you will do today in the poster session. You glue it to the wall, right? And then this stupid tape, it will detach, right? And then what is happening, this will roll up. So that's why we do it at the nanoscale. Simple, OK? So sorry for the super scientists that you can ask me later, but that's the point we are doing here. We make thin films, monolayers of different materials. It's very versatile. And once you roll it up, the key material is platinum. Again, like the same as George White said, we don't discover anything new. The platinum needs to be in the inside, because once you get this million of tubes that you design into, you put them into peroxide solution, the hydrogen peroxide will touch the wall they will make bubbles, and this bubble will push forward. So what we were seeing there is a bubble that is produced inside the tube is pushed forward or backwards, and then this momentum is, is increasing a, a force into the tube. So you see here uh, many of the tubes. And why this moving randomly? If I ask you to get, to get a piece of paper, and everyone will roll it in different ways, right? this a small asymmetry will make the bubbles to go with a defined torque. And this torque makes them go in randomly. 
Okay, but in the last years, we developed different methods on how to control the motion. And one method is very simply, very simple, is just if you look into nature, you will see also bacteria, magnetotactic bacteria contain iron nanoparticles. So why not to put iron in this sandwich? So that's what we do. One of these layers will be iron, and then you can control with a very simple uh, magnet, external magnet like here, or you can use a very complicated uh, magnetic coils. And we did this in collaboration with uh, TU20 in the Netherlands. We could control them from point A to point B in three dimensions. And this is a recent paper from us. See, they are self-powered, but then we control the motion. And what can they do for us? So they actually can push particles around. So that's a uh, whole story I did when I was in Dresden with, uh, with Smith. So we here as a microjet that is making bubbles from the propulsion coming from the inside and can put, uh, push magnetic particles or polymeric particles loaded with drugs. Uh, where could they swim? So if we go back to this uh, visionary dream, right, which is inside here, you need to reproduce these veins, these channels into the, the lab, and we make microfluidic chips uh, inducing a flow, and we've seen that this microjet can go against the flow. Okay, so this is one of the proofs that we do, like lap on a chip in the lab, uh, towards uh, guiding and to see if eventually we could go towards, uh, yeah, uh, upstream, actually. So very briefly, again, what we could do is control them. We can make them very small. And yeah, what we could manage to do here is to have a cancer cell. This microjet has been embedded here and kept drilling inside the cell. Okay, so this is a cancer cell, and the microjet was moving. We guided with a magnet, and then we direct to the target, and then stay drilling there. So what is the drawback here? The drawback is, again, the fuel from motion. So the fuel was peroxide. So the joke here is that the cell was dead before we kill it. Okay? So, but then getting the problem, finding the solution, that's what we basically do in our lab. Right? And then we saw, okay, what can we do with these guys? And we observed that these microjets generate a lot of bubbles. These microjets are small, like submarines, that can transport active moieties. And we thought, why not to clean water? And you will find, like, uh, you say, why? Why to clean water, right? So we can have self mixing, chemical reaction, active diffusion. And uh, this is supported now by a proof of concept from the ERC grant. And that's something that we do. We can clean ox um, yeah, organic dyes. And why are we interested in that? So what we found is that I in order to clean water, these are the, there are many processes, and in these processes, people use ozone or peroxide or uvulite, these very oxidative species. And if you remember, because I repeated three times already, we use peroxide, right? So, and I re if you remember, we could use any type of material I told you. So if we use peroxide, people use peroxide there. We use peroxide in our motion. And what if we put iron on the outside of this tube? So what we'll be doing is propelling something that is moving around free radicals. So that's the Fenton reaction. Okay, so we have a tube that is propelled by peroxide, so we are consuming this, and at the same time, it's oxidizing the outer surface, generating free radicals and iron 2, iron 3. And this is useful for cleaning water. So we have organics here, and after, in this case, five hours, then we could manage with these micro jets, we could clean water down to zero, uh, zero percent uh, organics. If you don't have any, uh, any active material, but the same passive material, this will not be clean in five hours. So we enhance the chemical reaction, okay? At the same time, what is, what is beneficial here? So it's micro in situ mixing, but also what we have is we don't produce any sludge. Sludge, so this precipitation, because what people do is like iron, peroxide, we clean water, form the sludge, take out the water, clean the precipitate, and then start second reaction. So in this case, as we are doing at the nanoscale, using the name of this nanotechnology meeting, right, we have only 10 nanometers of iron. We release a little bit of iron. That's enough for cleaning water. OK. So, and that's what we do. We have these microjets. And now the only problem is that we can clean something like this, which is this type of cups. We can clean one liter, five liters, probably, in, in few hours. The problem is that we cannot clean what people need at the companies, because now we're talking about with companies and they make a fun of us, right? Like basic science uh, still needs some steps to go into the um, technology transfer step, and they're asking for 30 cubic meters per day, 30, 30, 330 days per year, 
which is still challenging. So what for? We have an idea. What for? Still, we are far from using and cleaning a lake. But there might be some other places where uh, water is very scarce, so we could move. And we have some ideas on that. Also, OK, so what about this video? This video is showing that when we talk about price, it's also very expensive. But we thought, well, it has magnetic properties. So why not to take clean this water that is actually clean now in one hour instead of five? Uh, then we take a magnet, we collect them, and we reuse them again. And we have done this for a few weeks. Uh, actually, during one day, we took them out, we cleaned another cup, cleaned another cup like this every single hour for 24 hours. And then we are also doing week by week until, unfortunately, you may know this is Spain. Uh, here there are like long holidays, so my students stopped doing that, unfortunately. I could not deny the holidays to him. So, but I'm sure, because here you don't see any decrease, I'm sure this will have last longer and longer. Okay? But I think as a basic principle, it was fine. And here is just to show you the, the principle of micro-mixing or in-situ mixing that I was telling you about. It doesn't matter if they don't go anywhere. What we, we, we want is to mix a lot of the solution without any external energy. And uh, this is one hour, and after five weeks, you will see that actually becomes more energetic. And this is because with peroxide, we're cleaning the platinum, and this is a catalyst, so it's not consumed, and still is working very nicely. Okay, and then these are very large. This almost, this half a millimeter. You see how energetic these are. So we can tune from the tubes I showed you in the beginning. We can tune to completely different applications. So we don't want, uh, now these are not moving anywhere, but we can make them uh, directed. Okay, very briefly, also a couple of slides. We had a tube done by completely different technology, and we put graphene on the outside. As you are from the nanotechnology application, you might have heard about graphene, and, and what we know is that they can absorb heavy metals. And that's what we did. Something that is moving around, absorbing heavy metals, we can direct them because it's magnetic from A to B. Then a very interesting thing is that we can add acid, we release the heavy metal. Heavy metal is going back to the company, they want to reuse it, and we want to reuse the macro motor. So we can guide them again to our place and reuse it. And this attract a lot of attention from the media. That was from, uh, uh, I think, Science, Scientific American and several, like these uh, Nature Nanotech, they highlight this paper that we just published there. And this is just the concept, OK? We can also release the ions, and this is in microfluidic device. So I'm, we make a swarm of these guys, but here just for you to show you just one. So this microjet is moving from one place to another of the microchip. We could dock them here and going around, absorbing heavy metals. Then we change the magnetic field, we guide them to the other place, right? And then we release the heavy metal and we can send them back again. And that's twice the speed. That's, that's the only video that is speed up. This is just twice. Okay. Good. Let's move. I don't know how much time is. Uh, let's move to the second part. We also make spherical Janus particles, and that's something everyone can do in their lab. You can have a monolayer, so you can make a layer like this, make, uh, put particles that you can buy, uh, whatever, like Simaldric, polystyrene, silica particles. You can make uh, half-coated evaporate metals, and you can have already motors. Okay? So these are initially passive particles that when react with peroxide in this case, the peroxide is decomposed on the black dark side here. And then generate here is not true, right? We're not generating bubbles, but for you to understand that product is pushing the particle forward. Okay, this is not so ex exciting, probably, uh, like the videos as the other one, but for me, it's super interesting from the point of view of out of the equilibrium colloids and from physical point of view, it's super, super interesting. Okay, there are many things, so I'm showing you just one sixth of the activities we do. There are a lot of physics behind that. Um, so what can they do for us? If we go back to this initial video, as I promised you, this is something similar, right? We have uh, five microns motors that is continuously generated products, is continuously moving, and then it's moving a large cargo here, like these molecular motors, if you will. Uh, okay, so then whenever we want, we turn the magnetic field with our hands, and then this motor will rotate, deliver the cargo, and we can reuse it again. So still with this monolayer, you can have millions of particles in your lab, right? But only with one, you could do something interesting, something cool, right? We release this and we can use it again. So how small can we go? And over the last year, 
um, because I had an amazing postdoc, as you can see here, the same first author. He just moved back to 1,000 talents in China, to Harbin. So he has been working with mesoporous silicon nanoparticles, which I think is an amazing structure that has been used for drug delivery systems. And, and we say, why not to make a synergy to make these particles move? Let's make them active targeting. And so we went for the size of a bacteria down to the size of a virus. And I will just briefly run you through, through these achievements. These are some of the pictures we have. And we wanted to mimic nature's main in some jellyfish at the micro scale, but they actually move on the opposite direction as they should. As we don't understand anything, we talk to theoreticians. And then the theoreticians told us that something is happening in the inside, creating some flows. And then that's why this particle is moving actually in the opposite direction as they should move. So uh, this is in collaboration also with M Max Planck and Postec uh, in Korea. So if you're interested in this uh, mechanism motion, please check, check this paper. OK, going nano, we could make something very small, as I told you, in the size of a virus. This is about 90 nanometers, so it's difficult, very difficult to track, actually. Like, yeah, probably Jordi will tell me that this is impossible because optically you cannot resolve this type of, of particles. But we actually had a very nice master student who was developing a tracking code, removing all the background. And we could not only track this automatically, but we get all the set of data that allows us to calculate mean square displacement. So we've seen an enhancement on mean square displacement by adding hydrogen peroxide, even at that small nanoscale. Okay, but still this is peroxide. So even though it's 1% is still not good for the cells. So we can only play on a chip. So here what we do is we draw load with drugs, this nanoparticle, and we put them one side of the chip, and these particles will diffuse. But as you might imagine, the active particles might diffuse faster than the other ones. So we can do, these are the active, these are no active. So at this other side of the chip, I know this is always difficult to see, we have many more particles, so many more drug, or much more drug has been transported from one point to another point. So that's what for? Okay, so last part of my talk will be what if, we, I've been talking a lot about biology, about nature, so what if we combine again? Why not to take an artificial device, can be a tube, can be a particle, can be a wire, doesn't matter, and put an enzyme that can also make motion. So that's the idea. And this is actually, when I was in Japan, I saw this paper from Feringa, who got the Nobel Prize now, right? And you see, that's the video he showed. So this is a carbon nanotube. We look with glucose oxidase and catalase. The main idea is to use biocompatible fuels. So he had glucose that is converted to peroxide locally, and peroxide is, is converted to oxygen, and they said that this is a nanomotor. OK, so he, he didn't continue this work, and uh, he's very critical with that work as well. There are many tricks here. But it opened a lot of activities from other uh, people, including myself, because then I went to Germany and said, I want to do that, but I didn't manage. I failed. I could not make these guys moving with glucose, but I use enzyme, which is catalyst, which makes the same reaction as platinum, but much more efficient. You, you can see here in 1% peroxide, this enzyme-based tube moves, moves much faster than the, the platinum one. So it says, okay, something is possible, but not with the tubes. So on the last couple of years, and that's why we summarize in this review, there are many works from single enzyme to DNA machines to uh, nanoparticles, tubes, and even pumps using enzymes for motion. And that's just for over the last couple of weeks, a uh, couple of years, sorry. So that's very, very recent. So that's why I'm thinking that this could be uh, the, the future, and this is what I show you. So how, why I'm telling you this story? Because we finally succeeded on getting these guys moving, and the only way to get them was with this mesoporous silica nanoparticle. So we had this mesoporous silica that's about 200 nanometers or 300 almost. We put enzymes here, and these are really a bioarchitecture. We check toxicity. It's not biotoxic. It's metal-free. Metal it's, it's biofuel, as you will see, and it's nano size. And that's the way we do it. OK, we have a seed there, and this uh, silica we coat. Uh, well, polystyrene can be also, like, you can coat with the silica on the top. Um, you dissolve the interior, and we have like almost like a golf ball, but now it's hollow. Okay, you put amino groups on the top, so it's ready for functionalization, and that you make a monolayer, the one that was showing you here on the table. You evaporate any material you want. You want magnetic control, put magnetic material. You want platinum, just put platinum. You want wool for uh, binding some receptors, just put it there, so you have it there. So, and then you can immerse in a drug solution, 
this will go in the inside. Since only this side is functionalized with amino group, you can bind enzymes, and then you have already a two-phase particle. It's a Janus particle, so where the reaction will happen only on the one side. And that's why this is pushing forward. So instead of doing what Feringa was doing with two enzymes, this is very complicated. This cascade of enzymes is complicated. We just use one enzyme. And we have here catalase, urease, and glucose oxidase. So three, three different examples, and they all work. Okay? They all move. Here I'm showing the tracking from the optical image, increasing the fuel concentration, which is urea. So we can have a diffusion enhanced by adding more more fuel, but the most interesting was actually these two, which are uh, physiological. We took the numbers of physiological media, right, on glucose and urea, and they move, actually. Okay, just quickly here, we can use this for different applications, micro reactors, um, encapsulation, micro transport, not only about nanomotors. And we can also stop the motion. The enzymes can be quenched by, or can be uh, yeah, stopped by silver or mercury or different salts, actually. And this guy was moving around, and then upon addition of the salt, this guy is totally stuck here. So it doesn't go anywhere. And you can resume again the motion several times by adding something that will take the ions out of the, the enzyme. And then you can stop and go, stop and go many, many times. And that's a chemical control that we just uh, published also a couple of months ago. I will just move forward for the sake of time. OK, you add the DDT, and it's moving again. Okay, so I think is I don't need to convince you anymore that we, if we have magnetic material on one side, we can use small magnet and rotate. But again, don't think about any co any complicated uh, thing. So we are not even using TMs like Jordi and Sophie's again. It's just a magnet you can take from the fridge and put under your sample and turn right and left. It's very simple, right? Uh, so here it's just we add the magnet, so it was more random motion like bacteria, run and tumble. But then you apply magnetic field, it keeps straight. You release it and then turn, and you can control this on demand. And this is a really is urea based motor, okay? So this is all biocompatible here, biofuel. And this is a current research we are doing in our lab now in IBEC. We can put a really with cells, and then the nanoparticles will go inside the cell, as you can probably see here. And then we can have SEM showing the, this, these particles inside there. Um, are they dead or not? We will see. Uh, now we need to do a lot of studies like drug loading, how much drug is delivery. So, but we are, at this we're going step by step and there were some challenges that we are, we are moving forward like the fuel and the, the biostructure. So just the last couple of slides, what we, we try to do is a lot of synergy and a lot of collaboration without our, within our group. So basic structure, basic ideas from tubes can be combined with hybrid, with enzymes, and also spherical. And that's, that's a result that we, you will see here. We just published also last two weeks ago, I think. So what you're going to see is a tube. OK, it's a microjet, let's say. It's powered by enzyme and is made of silica. So why I'm putting this light here before? This year, because the guy is doing enzyme-based motors with silica, said, well, Samuel, everyone is doing tubes in your group, so why not to make a tube made of mesoporosilica? And why not to make this mesoporosilica tube using enzymes? So that's a combination that you will see right now. And actually, I didn't show, but we got, I mean, the, the chair said we got the, the Guinness record of the smallest man-made jet engine, we wa which was 600 nanometers in diameter. And here, we just submitted another record because we make it three times smaller. So this is about 200 nanometers in diameter. OK, so the first time I saw this video, I told to my person, no, so you have a contamination with bacteria in your sample. And this is not true, because they, then he showed me, no, you can make, yeah, this is not a bacteria, this is artificial nanomotor, and I can make them longer. Say, so, OK, how long can you make them? And what's the, the physics be or hydrodynamics behind this? What are we learning from that? So the longer you make them, the more directional they are. And the, this nano needle structure is good for, we hope, is going to be better than a spherical particle for in cell internalization and tissue, tissue targeting. Okay, so you can see this very long, but it's more straight. Okay, so that's all. So the chair is still not kicking me out. Uh, so I hope I could convince you that these nanomotors are self powered. You don't need to apply any energy. So it's in situ generation, local gradient or to move, to move uh, around. They are smart. I didn't show you many of these, but just at least one concept. We have 10 
10 stories, as I told you, like, but only one has least magnetic control. These chemotaxis, thermotaxis, they are different ways that we can control with light, etc., temperature. Uh, they can do some complex, ta complex tasks, and I show you at least three, three of the examples we have in our lab. And if you want to do some bio application, you need to make them biocompatible. So hopefully one day one can do this. Okay, so have, now we have some items here. We have the size, we have the propulsion, we have the biocompatibility, but there are many challenges. So this is kind of a crazy idea because if you imagine these nanoparticles inside your bloodstream, they, they might not compete with the flows. Okay, so we are thinking about other applications rather than this one, which are going to places where it's difficult to reach, right? High viscous media and, and no nonotonal fluids like, like this, okay? But one of the ideas and the dreams is to have, at least you need to have a vision. Uh, let's say, let's see when, when someone reached there, maybe it's not me, but uh, this was shown in Nature Reviews by other people that from a basic idea, foundational research to the treatment of any disease takes 35 years, okay? So uh, the nanoparticle I show you, the first paper was published 2015. So you can imagine how, when is this expected to happen? Okay, so thank you very much, and thank you for the financial support. I'm glad to get questions.